In the piano world, the six foot mark is a very important one. Usually people say over six foot or under six foot when comparing pianos. Today we look at the GX3 from Kawai, the first installment of an over six foot piano in the GX series. Coming in at six foot two is a very sought after instrument, an incredible sound, very well balanced, and really just rich in tone. So we're really excited to bring it to you today. Let's take a look at it. Hi, this is Ted with Alamo Music Center in downtown San Antonio, Texas. I'm Patrick Marr. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channels, check out our other videos, sign up for notifications, like our videos, leave us comments. We appreciate your support and we love to interact with you. We're going over six feet today. We're going over six feet. This is, you know, where people usually think, oh, an intermediate player has an over six foot piano and like I'm, you know, a novice or, you know, like it, it's one of those things where it's, it's clearly not really a big difference between a 5.11 and a 6.1 or 6.2, but in people's mind, it's really kind of just a huge breaking point. We're, we're talking about, you know, <laughs> a couple inches. Um, yeah, but it shows up in the price line too. It does. That's the it, other it, thing. It does. So uh, this is right where, you know, the C3 by Yamaha, uh, you know, enters the scenery as well as six foot one. Um, but the GX3 from Kawhi has a very rich history, um, very similar to, um, you know, we have done a video on the GX2, but, but Kawhi really is, is a very sought after instrument in this, in this uh, size. Uh, but the, uh, the number 600, which we don't see as much as the number 500 right. by Kawhi, um, but this is way, you know, pre 70s, um, right, you know, right when Kawhi was making its way over here to the United States, um, the number 600 uh, started appearing, um, you know, not as popular as the number 500, but you know, that over six foot, it was a six foot one, very popular instrument, uh, you know, transformed into the KG3. Um, so the KG series from Kawhi, um, you know, was A and B with, uh, with the C series, the conservatory series from, from Yamaha. Um, but the KG series we saw in churches and teacher studios and performance venues. Um, and really just, you know, an incredible, incredible piano. I, I think you have great you, instrument. You've yeah. played many the, the, KGs in your time. I have. The KG yeah. threes are usually found in, you know, what I always call like a more expensive venue, like a church that has more money mm -hmm. uh, than say like a, a dance hall or one of these uh, Elks Lodge or whatever they kind of have, those places have pianos in them too. Mm -hmm. uh, but the KG threes were always, you know, in a spot where it would be shown off in the, in the church. Yeah, so, uh, so six foot one again um, on the KG three, um, fast forward to the 90s, the RX series comes out for Kawhi um, with some, you know, modern advancements in uh, how they used ABS in the action and how uh, they constructed the whole instrument. And the RX series takes off. It's the RX3. Um, and in 2004, they introduced a new, a new uh, action to it and put the Millennium 3 action, which took the world by storm. And, and it's uh, uh, still the action that is used in all Kawhi pianos, whether you're looking at a GL series, their entry line series, all the way up to their SK, the Shiguru Kawhi series. Um, but uh, that, it was introduced in 2004, so you have the RX series really starting to come to life as this modern instrument. Um, and then in uh, 2010, they added a little bit more and changed it to uh, the Black Series, the RX Black Series, um, still going to be coming in as a, uh, an RX3. Um, and then we saw in 2013 um, a big change, and they said, hey, we're going to redo this whole series. We're going to change it to the GX3 Black Series. Um, and so the GX Series um, kind of was the answer I would say they probably were working on it for a very long time, but uh, was, the, at least from a marketing perspective, the answer to the X series from, the, from, from Yamaha. Yamaha. So, you know, these two, you know, we'll call them rivals because they come from the same city in, in Japan, uh, Hamamatsu, Japan, that, you know, they very rich history of making incredible instruments, um, competitive rivals. Yeah, you but know? these guys lived in the same neighborhood. The, yeah, and, 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 and it's... And it's uh, you know, I always like to reinforce that. These guys come from the same neighborhood. They though. come from the same neighborhood, but, uh, you know, you fast forward almost 100 years, and the, the, the C3X and the, you know, these, the X series, C7X, CFX, Kawhi says, hey, we have an amazing instrument as well. Let's relaunch it as the G3. 
three, the GX three, um, and uh, and they added a whole bunch of stuff. But really, yeah, what I like about it is they just didn't release a new piano like the GX three. They released a whole GX piano line, mm -hmm. and. Um, Part of that is their, their marketing they came out with. I love the way they came out with it. They have elements of artistry, elements of tone, elements of precision, and elements of strength. Mm -hmm. And all that sounds like, wow, that's about playing the piano perfect. No, it's about making the piano perfect. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily playing the piano perfect or being a perfect pianist. And uh, those are that's kind of how they you know, resigned to put every one of their improvements and changes into one of those kind of categories in terms of marketing. It made a lot of sense. Yeah, and, you know, they really relaunched the whole thing, uh, you know, from top to bottom. They said, okay, this is, you know, how we're going to improve the rim. This is how we're going to improve um, the soundboard. This, you know, the keys are going to be longer. It actually gained an inch in this process. Um, and, uh, you know, the keys got longer, but so did the stretcher bar over um, kind of holding the whole instrument together. We'll get more technical here in a little bit after we listen to the instrument. Um, but really kind of just a, a reimagination of their top, their, you know, their top Kawhi product. Um, I do want to add one thing. Yeah. When they first came out with the, the ABS action that used to be in the RX uh, piano, the first piano I played in the RX series was an RX3. And I went and played one, and then at that time we were not Kawhi dealers. So mm -hmm. I had to go two other places to, uh, to play these pianos because you just don't play one, you play a couple of them, right? And the first one I played was an RX3. And in my mind, I was thinking, I'm going to compare this to a C3 and see what it does. And my first reaction was just, wow, that's, that's like a great, great piano. Yeah. And I noticed that the action um, had better repetition and it, had, it just seemed to be more precise. Yeah. Um, not necessarily than a C3, but from the majority of the other six-foot pianos that I mm -hmm. had played out there. But uh, the RX3 was the first one I played that, that actually did not have a wooden action in it. And I really, really liked it. I thought it was almost too smooth to be a piano. Yeah, and, and uh, the thing I've always appreciated about Kawhi is they're very upfront about what the changes are going into the instrument. Whereas, and why. Yeah, and why they're doing it. And as some manufacturers, they'll change a the name. They'll say, oh, we have this new product we're unveiling. And, you know, there, there's some, like, cosmetic things that you see differently. But really, it's hard to tell what actually changed in the instrument. It still, you know, for the most part seems very similar and you know it's trade secrets they're not going to release what exactly changed but just know it's a better instrument trust right. us we use better materials <laughs> the price got more expensive and uh, you'll like it more uh, and you know usually it is a better instrument but it's really kind of hard to trace those details um, but let's take a listen to the gx3 let's play it here um, have a nice listen and uh, and kind of talk about some of the more technical features when we come back, um, what makes the GX3 unique, what makes the GX series unique. Uh, but let's first listen.
Well, Patrick, did you notice the elements of artistry in that piano that they built in there for you? I mean, it, it's <laughs> it's incredible because we you know we had just been playing a GX2 recently and playing the GX3 and just how you know the overall character of the instrument can be a little bit different and and uh, uh, you just get a different sense. It, it's it's it speaks to you differently. Um, it re it responds differently. I, what I love about this one is. Um, it's actually going to a university here in, in the next week or two. It's with, with 20, we're in 2022 here, um, but with uh, you know there being constraints on getting inventory right now, there's you know a little bit of a crisis of inventory. Um, we haven't had a GX3 in a, in a little bit. We had an SK3 recently that went to to someone's home, um, but you know sometimes we don't see a model for a little bit just because right. for whatever reason we got a couple GX2s in or a GX5 in. Um, but I hadn't played a GX3 in a, in a little bit, and this one was earmarked for a university that, that's getting it here in San Antonio. Um, and we just had a technician come out and really just made the thing kind sing. of sing. Yeah, and, and it's um, really just it, when you think of balance in this in this range, the, in that like 5, 10 to 6, I think 6.5 you get a little bit big, but really the balance of going, as you've talked about before, the bass all the way through to, to, the, to the treble and you're and you just hear no breaks. You hear it's just almost like a, a perfectly flawless piano. Mm -hmm. And and really, you <coughs> see a lot of sizes crammed into this in the five ten. You know, even five eight to about six and a half feet. You see a lot of piano sizes crammed in there. Um, and then once you get over that, it's like seven, seven and a half, nine. And so like it 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 gets less precise as you get right high, as you get you know to a, a larger instrument. But right here, there's a lot crammed in, and I think for good reason. There's small minute changes to um, you know to the scale design where the breakover is. Um, string length is very similar, but uh, you know there's little bit of differences. Um, but I think uh, I think it's going to be cool when we do a comparison of a GX3 versus a GX2, and really just kind of dial in what are the Fine small tune yeah the what are those small things and why does it why does this one respond differently than than this one? And I think that will be a very interesting topic. Well. Part of it is you're supposed to notice straight off hand is with the, the action is that they have this nice kind of touch to the key tops. That mm -hmm. makes it nice. Uh, it's like you're playing an old kind of like ivory feeling piano keys and the ebony's feel like ebony's. Yeah. And so that, that's one of the things that... The neotext, right? The neotext. They, mm -hmm. they had this a name for that they put on there. And also this is a GL one, but they, they have a solid uh, mahogany hammer on, on mm -hmm. the GX3. And that's another thing that they talked a lot about was um, these hammers making a difference. And I guess it, I don't know if you've ever spent any time looking at the slow motion on YouTube when the when the impact and you see how much they bend and stuff like yeah. that. So that that's kind of a different um, you know insight on it as well. But the main thing that that you're really feeling is their push for being able to play lightly and faster uh, at a, at a very consistent uh, level. And part of that is because they have a longer key length. And they have more separation with the uh, the piano buttons, so that you can actually play lighter by just touching lighter, and and everything still works. I mean, it mm -hmm. still triggers the action, and so that's part of what their their artistry, in terms of what they give the artist, is like. Look, you're getting a longer, uh, more leverage, more balanced leverage, and you're getting more sturdier parts. And then absolutely, you have this, you know, their uh, carbon fiber action in there, mm -hmm. which is just exaggerates everything about playing the piano so that marketing toward the artistry is that this is what we're giving a player mm -hmm. so a player can imagine that well I, I always like to think of like a seesaw or like a tool it's like the longer it is like the more nuance you have right. the more you can be delicate but really get a lot of power or leverage um, sure. and, it, and it's just you know it's it's interesting to think that how that can have such an effect when you when you look at keyboards and you see like the small keys and just how much is added well, when you, just a snap throws up a lot more energy at the other end. And so, yeah, so really they're trying to hone all that in from the touch, you know, right there sitting in front of the keys, your connection with the instrument, the neotext, through the longer key, through the key button, the, the balance key button, uh, just a lot of control right there at the fingertips. Well, the connection with the musician is made, you know, not just when, how it plays, but the sound that comes out and when it comes out, mm -hmm. is it immediately? Is it just about where it's supposed to be? I mean, people can tell, man, the sound is a little delayed sometimes. Yeah. You get a keyboard that's like that, it's older sluggish action. But on this, you have an immediate tone, and part of what, what their strength is in the remarketing and, and redesigning of the GX series was to increase 
everything that goes into making the tone of the piano better and stronger. Mm -hmm. And so part of uh, what they have here is they came out with the core, I think, which stands for Collected Optimal Reflected Energy. There it is, yeah. And so the idea behind that is when you hit a note on a piano, the string vibrates and it goes through the, through the bridge onto the soundboard. Those vibrations go out to the rim and then they come back through the soundboard. But the core part that they're talking about here the, the, uh, in, in terms of, of the core is that they actually have the beams that support the rim of the piano, which gives it the, you know, the shape of a grand piano. Mm -hmm. They go like the spokes of a tire right to the center of the main cross beam, which is underneath the pin block and the soundboard. And it's actually over incorporated from the top of the pin block from from their stretcher bar as well mm -hmm. so all of that is designed to be like a rock solid stable foundation almost like a powerful cantilever for everything that's out in front and it works yeah. because yamaha used to have the tone collector which was the same kind of thing except instead of going to a, a metal collecting point they had a rounded collecting point and they used to put like an upside down salad bowl looking thing up underneath there, you could reach up underneath and I've feel it. I've seen those before, yeah. And, and, and it almost touches the soundboard. It's right up there underneath the pin block. And so it's kind of the same kind of uh, design. Concept, yeah. It's and, and they also have a special name for their rim. It's called, uh, I think it's the Kansai Kotegi uh -huh. rim, which is the way that they build the rim with different um, cross banded laminates of wood. But it's not just any random wood. They pick out a uh, different kind of um, cellular structure. In mm -hmm. other words, ones that have a little bit more porous cells in it, yeah. and then ones that are tighter as it gets out to the rim. Mm -hmm. So supposedly the higher frequencies are, are, are reflected a little bit more with these uh, the small pores, the, yeah. the smaller, smaller pored cells. And then it gets a little bit warmer as it goes out. So it's really kind of about balance. It is about balance. And the other thing that they've done on these pianos is they taper the soundboards all mm -hmm. the way around. So instead of just having a solid soundboard up to the rim, they, they taper it down so that the centerpiece of the soundboard can float. It can float better for where it's attached. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, with all of the tight, uh, you know, they make a big deal out of their, their, the way that their joints are put together. Uh, they have four point uh, with dowel increase, so it's almost like it's one solid piece of wood and then it's machine screwed in uh, so that it's like it's one solid foundation for the rim of the piano. Mm -hmm. And they extend that into the key bed. They have all these special things they put in the key bed so the action and all that is all balanced and, and stable. And the other thing that contributes to the tone is their bridge design. They redesigned the bridge on these pianos. Uh, on the GX series, they have 11 layers of uh, mahogany and maple, and they're cross-banded and they're laminated so that the sound, the energy travels immediately to the soundboard and then out to the rim and it keeps going around, you know, based on the strength. So it's not normally vertically lit on, on other pianos? Some don't... pianos are, they're solid okay. and some of them they're, they're, um, they're, it's just a solid piece of wood, but the, the sound does transfer better through laminated pieces of wood, vertically especially on, on the bridges. Yeah. And when you're using two different types of, of hardwoods, uh, you're going to get two different kind of responses. Mm -hmm. It makes that's part of their you know laminated bridges just transfer energy a lot more efficient efficiently okay. and speedily uh, than than a, a full okay. full wooden yeah. bridge. Um, other things they have in terms of precision, you can see here it's hard for to make the adjustment. These are actually rails, and so on a piano when there's 88 of these, these thing, this these aluminum parts are set to the foundation at the end of where the key reaches. And then also where the, the action rails go, they're always going to be exactly precise. Mm -hmm. And on some pianos, these used to be wood, this used to be wood. And the first time that someone put a metal action rail on a piano, it was like, you know, big talk of the town. Kind of yeah. like the first time someone put carbon fiber action in, in, into a different kind of components into mm -hmm. it. Big talk of the time. But what's neat about this is instead of using a traditional sandpaper type, they actually serrated and made the top of this aluminum action rail just like sandpaper. And they also talk a bit about this hammer flange and how it's supported and reinforced on the side here so that there's no splitting on these. I have seen a number of uh, pianos over the years, the older ones, they split right here at this, this point because that's where all the energy is released from the action. It comes right up through here and it throws the hammer up. But this is where all the stress point is at. So a lot of times you see them split right here. They have it reinforced with that. Looks like they have that ABS like a, yeah, right, resin on on there, yeah, yeah. right on the edge of it. Uh -huh. 
Very nice. So, you know, that's kind of what they have in terms of how the action rails lay out. And it is really a neat design. After looking at so many of these, you know, both the, the GXs and SKs and the JLs over the last couple of years, when we get an older piano and like we had an older Baldwin coming, it's like, whoa, it looks like it's missing some stuff. Exactly. It just looks different. Yeah, and it's kind of like the changeover when automobiles went from to having catalytic converters and all this uh, environmental stuff in the, in, in the early to mid 70s. Well, I can't work on that car. It had all this other stuff over. You couldn't see, you couldn't even see the motor after a while. It was all covered up with safety features. I heard there's good money in those catalytic converters. Oh, there's converters. a lot of good money in catalytic <laughs> converters. That's a, that's a hot topic that's, here. Yeah. In, um, anyway, the other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of the strength I mentioned a little bit was the, um, the stretcher um, overreach bar mm -hmm. uh, that they have. They actually exaggerated that size of the, the stretcher bar to incorporate the pin block so that the pin block is actually bigger than it needs to be. So the stretcher bar is right there underneath your, basically your music rest. It's right there in yeah, front of right you. Yeah, it's right there in front of um, you. And on these Kawhi's, it's about, what, almost three and a half, four it's inches. Very thick, it's, yeah. it's very thick. And most pianos, it's going to be down just around two, two and a half but it, inches. It's almost an extension of your frame because it's really what's holding the whole it thing is. together. It is. It's an extension of the frame. And then they also include a bigger frame or kind of like a holding type frame. Mm -hmm on the pin block so it, it goes yeah, it's over all attached. it's so all it's, attached so it's for structure and stability it's, it's really trying, trying to keep the whole thing together yeah yeah keep it nice and tight so that everything else can can uh, can can work and then you know they have a great pin block laminated pin block and they put those you know nickel shiny nickel pin uh tuning pins in there uh it's a really really straight um i mean it's straight out redesign mm -hmm. Almost when you hear someone from the factory design it, you're thinking, that almost sounds like over-engineering. Yeah. And I even asked the guy, I said, isn't that kind of over-engineering? He said, not really. Because he said, when you look at the length of time that a piano will be around, this is, this is what we're thinking is, gonna, is how a piano should be built. That's why they do it. And the other thing that they do is they, have, um, they use the same consistent pro, uh, uh, kind of plates. They're V-Pro. Yeah. Uh, so instead of having the the steel poured into it it's drawn through so there's no bubbles inside the frame yeah. at all right? yeah. air bubbles no and it, it's it all comes together to really be the most structure but also the most freeing on the soundboard and you know the most control in the key and you know they're, they're really trying to be in the mind of a player and say what what do players not even know that they need or be want? Be a dream piano. How do, what does it take to make a dream piano? It's nothing that you're going to see. Mm -hmm. It's going to be stuff that's going to be built into it. And so, so the GX3 at 6.2, again, just an incredible instrument. Uh, I believe MSRP on it is right around 55000 um, So that's retail price. Of course, go to you know, local dealers, talk to them, see if they can get you a good deal. I know there's, there's been back order problems and things like that, but uh, it's, it's definitely an incredible, incredible instrument. If you've owned any of the GX series, or played any of them. Uh, the GX2, again, being probably the most popular just in the sizing at the 511. Uh, please leave some comments, uh, talk about your experience. Um, a lot of people will compare these to the, the C series from Kawhi and go back and forth and back and forth. And, and uh, you know, in our experience, we've seen a lot of people choose Kawhi just because of a lot of these, you know, technical advancements that they've done, not only in the action, but really trying to create a better, longer sustaining, more dynamic sounding instrument. Um, really just a, a shining bright point in the piano industry right now is the GX series from Kawhi. Um, it does, it does go up from, from the GX to the SK series, um, which is the Shiguru Kawhi, almost a different brand completely from Kawhi, but a lot of the same ideas right. amplified there. Um, and so we will, we'll take a look at the SK3. We'll take a look at, um, comparing this GX3 to maybe the GX, um, the GX2 and maybe the GL50, which is uh, the, you know, the... It's the largest GL they make. Yeah, so the GL is... is, is um, it's like the GX3. Yeah, it's the same size. It's a six foot two, um, same scale design, um, but some of these really unique features you won't find. Um, different rims, they're gonna, it's going to have, uh, you know... Different bridge. It's just a different, it's a different instrument, um, but very similar scale design. Um, actually, the same scale design. It's it's same uh, Millennium Three action, but you know, kind of just a very different instrument and a different price point. So it's going to be less expensive. Um, but that would be an interesting one to look at and compare because be they a are really good comparison. Both, both manufactured in the Japanese factory um, for Kawaii, but really kind of very different instruments. Um, 
Well, thank you guys for watching. This is Ted Barcelou. I'm Patrick Marr. If you are in the Austin, San Antonio area, or if you're in Kansas City or St. Louis, come say hi. We have stores in those markets um, and uh, you know, always looking to, to meet some of you guys out in, in public. And uh, hopefully you guys are staying safe, playing piano. Um, make sure you're subscribed so that you can catch up on more great content and uh, see some more comparisons of GXs and SKs and GLs and you know anything that comes into the store. Hopefully, get you guys a video for. Thank you guys for watching.